India is well known for its incredible monumental architecture. Hindu temples with their distinctive regional variations, including the Nagar style with its shikhar towers representing mountains. The Kalinga style of Eastern India, such as the Konak Sun Temple. The Southern Dravidian style with their brightly painted pyramidal Gopuram gateways. The ghats, or steps, leading down to India's sacred rivers. Here are the temples and palaces beside the river Ganges in what might well be the world's oldest continually inhabited city, Varanasi. Enigmatic Buddhist stupas, like Sarnath, outside Varanasi, where monks practice to this day, and where Buddha first taught the Four Noble Truths, having received enlightenment in Bodh Gaya. The fresco-covered caves of Ajanta and the mountaintop monasteries of Ladakh. The decorated pillars of Jain temples like Ranakpur in Rajasthan. The Islamic architecture of the Mughals like Shah Jahan's Jama Masjid in Delhi. And of course, the Taj Mahal. And churches too, of every denomination, including those built by Catholic, Jesuit, Portuguese in Goa. British Protestants in cities like Calcutta and Delhi and the Christians of Kerala. New religiously inspired creations continue to be built up to the present day. For example, the Baha'i Face Lotus Temple in Delhi, built in the 1980s. And the Swami Narayan community's Akshadam, also in Delhi, and built at the turn of the millennium, not much more than 15 years ago. It even has an IMAX theater, musical fountains, a robot show, and a sort of theme park style boat ride through Indian history, as well as the stunning main building surrounded by its carved colonnades. There are thousands of forts and palaces too, most famously perhaps those of the Rajputs of Rajasthan, visited by millions from India and around the world each year. There's Jaipur's Amar Fort, where you take a ride on elephants all the way up the ramparts and through the palace gates. And there is Udaipur with its lake palace, where the James Bond film Octopussy was filmed. There's Jodhpur's Maranga Fort. You can even stay in them too. Umed Bhavan, the largest private home built in the 20th century, was voted the best hotel in the world by TripAdvisor visitors. There's India's own Great Wall, the heavily fortified Kumbhulgar. In southern India is the mysterious and breathtaking Hampi, once one of the largest and wealthiest cities of the world, when in the 14th, 15th and 16th centuries, it was known as Vijayanagar, city of victory. And the magnificent Mysore palace, completed in the 20th century, surrounded by temples and elephant stables, which are used to this day. Also in Mysore is one of the great achievements of contemporary architecture in India, the Mysore campus of IT giant Infosys. Designed like a university campus, 
with classrooms, recreation areas, sports fields and accommodation. Each year tens of thousands of young Indian graduates come here to live and train for their new careers. American students come too and take part in the Emphasis InStep internship program, which we'll share more about next week. India also has a long tradition of urban planning, designing and creating entire communities based around a master plan. The tradition stretches back 5,000 years. A number of cities, amongst the largest in the world at the time, the Harappan civilization, named after the nearby town to where the site was rediscovered in the early 20th century in what is now Pakistan, a civilization that stretched for thousands of miles and was home to some of the world's largest cities of its time. These cities were planned on grid systems and had sophisticated drainage, as well as municipal areas including a great bath and a citadel. Also known as the Indus Valley Civilization, it was even more extensive than the contemporaneous Egyptian or Mesopotamian civilizations. Some people actually now prefer to call it the Indus Sarasvati Civilization, due to the fact its main settlements appear on either side of a long dried up river which runs to the east of the Indus. This can clearly be seen by overlaying the location of sites onto satellite imagery. The second mysterious major river that the civilization seemed to be concentrated around may well be the sacred Sarasvati river of Vedic mythology. Other examples of planned cities include the 19th century city of Jaipur, the pink city as it's known, and those built with that mid 20th century obsession, concrete, in the early days of independent India. Bhubaneswar, in the eastern state of Odisha. Gandhinagar, the state capital of Gujarat, and Chandigarh, which serves as capital of both Punjab and Haryana, as well as being a union territory, meaning it's run from Delhi. This city, in fact, was designed by Le Corbusier, the French modernist architect. New cities are being born all the time in India. In the last two decades, on the outskirts of Delhi, are examples of private and public-led planned cities. To the southwest, near the airport, is the privately planned Gurgaon, which is where General Electric established their Genpact outsourcing centre at the end of the 1990s, followed by many multinationals in the years since. To the southeast is Greater Noida, which is home to India's Formula One Grand Prix racetrack, amongst many other ambitious commercial and residential real estate projects. If you're studying architecture or urban planning, then what better place to study the difference between private-led versus public-led master plans than in Delhi and the two satellite cities of Gurgaon and Noida, Greater Noida. Plans are already being shared for Amravati, which will be the new capital of Andhra Pradesh. In the western Ghats to the east of Mumbai lies Lavasa, a private city being built around a lake high up in the hills. Unfortunately, we don't have much time now to explore much of India's vast artistic creativity. However, of course, we have provided lots of links in the next further resources section. But we must at least acknowledge some of it. The sculptural tradition in India dates back 5,000 years with the figurines found in Harappa and Mohenjo-daro. The Emperor Ashoka's pillars from the third century BC with their lion capitals which are now the official emblem of the government of India. Then there was the Indo-Greek Buddhist art of Gandhara, flowing hair and contraposto poses. The extraordinary 8th century rock-cut Kailash temple complex in Ellora, where an entire hillside was carved out over hundreds of years. The 10th century temples of Kajarao in Madhya Pradesh, with their delicate and sometimes erotic depictions of the human form. About 20 of the original 80 plus survive to this day, some dedicated to the Hindu god Lord Shiva, others belonging to the Jain tradition. One of which features the earliest recorded 4x4 magic square, using what would evolve into the numerals we use today. 
there are the magnificent thousand-year-old Chola bronzes from southern India, best known for their Shiv Natraja, the lord of the cosmic dance. We briefly saw some of the frescoes that can be found in temples and caves. India's painting tradition went on to include the instantly recognisable Mughal and Rajput miniature style. Then, of course, there is the folk art of India's many tribal communities. From the forests of central India to the hilly northeast. And in modern day India, there is, of course, street art, including this graffiti exhibition held in a container park in Delhi earlier in 2016. In many museums in America, Britain and elsewhere around the world, you will find Indian collections, sculpture, jewellery, paintings. Much of it, of course, was looted during the colonial era and then sold on through the international market. I encourage you to visit those museums and galleries and introduce yourself firsthand to some of these marvels of Indian art. And better still, come to India so that you can see them where they should be, in the buildings, in the temples, and in some of the well-run government museums. India's creative expression through music and dance is also extraordinary and well worth exploring. We've included links in the next further resource section, but unfortunately don't have time now to go into too much detail. Let me conclude this section by saying that almost all of this rich cultural creativity is inspired by India's mythologies and philosophies, rich with their spiritual symbolism. Their many purposes include enabling experience of and even participation in the divine and to help us learn through the stories that they tell. 